today. Um, welcome. We're going to talk um, a little bit about how to um, convince uh, leadership to care. And for for those of you who can see the screen, it says care about accessibility. I, I should um, air quotes that. Uh, you know, obviously everybody cares about accessibility, but um, you know what we're really talking about is doing something about accessibility, right? Like, so we're uh, for for your managers that may be with you or may see the slides or, or presentation later, we're, we're not implying that people don't care about accessibility, but what we're really talking about here is, um, you know, what, what is this and, and what should we do about it? Um, uh, and many of you have probably attended some of our webinars in the past and are in a situation where, um, you know, that's a conversation that you need to have with, with your boss and your boss's boss and others in your organization. Um, so, oh, let me see here if I can, yeah, so just a real quick introduction um, uh, on myself. My name is Travis Moraska. I'm a solutions architect here at TQ Systems. Um, I've been here just about five years um, working um, with, with our, our sales organization, our, our product um, and, and services organizations uh, with customers all over the world trying to implement accessibility programs. Um, before DQ, I was a, a DQ customer. Uh, my background is front end development. Um, and I, like many of you on the call, um, came into accessibility uh, with you know, some, some degree of, of ignorance and surprise and um, you know, didn't necessarily understand um, all of the, the challenges that, that some of the consumers of the UI um, that, that myself and my organization uh, what was creating and, um, you know, how that uh, may be consumed differently by, by people with different technologies or different abilities. So, um, you know, a, a story I think that a lot of you might relate to, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my past life before DQ today and, um, you know, a lot about how I've seen other organizations you know, turn this from uh, a, a concern um, that, that the business and, and the tech, technology departments have had um, into, you know, a, a sustainable program and, um, you know, just another part of, uh, you know, shipping quality code and good user experience. So uh, enough about me, like, let's jump in. Um, so um, just for, uh, for for the people who can see my screen and for those that may not be able to, um, th there's not really a lot going on visually um, in, in the presentation today. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, repeat everything that, that's on the screen for those of you who can't see the screen. And for those of you who can, it's really just a backdrop to the conversation. So just want to make sure that those who um, yeah, may be on the phone or, or may um, not be able to see the screen uh, that uh, you, you're not missing out. If there's a visual or a diagram, um, I'll, I'll do my best to explain that. And when you get the slides, there'll be, um, Laura often, you know, will come behind and clean that up and make that look great uh, in terms of, of text alternatives. Um, so today we're, we're gonna talk about um, challenges rela related to um, the adoption of good accessibility practices in the organization. Um, we're gonna talk about how um, to that end, um, identifying and um, reaching out to, to other uh, folks in the organization, so cross-functional partnerships, um, if you will, uh, can really jumpstart your accessibility journey. So, um, you know, if you're a developer or, or a QA or a UX person um, that, that's trying to get people involved in your particular group, whether it's technology or, or QA, um, you know, there, there might be other people that you haven't thought of in your organization that can be great partners and that can really bring focus on accessibility. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, objection handling strategies. So, um, you know, if, if you're hit with those hard questions, like why is this really a problem or a risk for us? Um, are, are these people actually consumers of our content? Um, are, you know, what, what, why should we do this? You know, again, I think everybody cares uh, about the ability of others to, you know, participate and access goods and services. But, you know, sometimes when the rubber meets the road, it's, 
uh, you know, how real is this uh, of an issue for us? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Risks first rewards and return on investment, um, you know, because if we're, if we're going to spend money on tools, if we're going to spend money on process change, um, you know, what are we getting back for that and why should we do it? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And again, I'll weave that in with um, a, a little, you know, some anecdotes from um, how, how I had some success before I, I joined DQ as a, um, you know, accessibility uh, program participant and, you know, things I've seen across many different verticals and, and, and sectors in the market. Um, so, um, so what, what exactly are we talking about here? What is the challenge? Surely everybody wants to make digital content accessible, right? There's, um, you know, to, to use a real, uh, a brick and mortar analogy, there's, there's no builder that says, why do we need a ramp or why do we need an elevator? Uh, you know, people aren't waking up every morning trying to make things difficult for people who, who may have disabilities, but, um, when it comes to digital content, you know, well, why isn't this easier? Why isn't this built in? Why do we have to invest in this? Uh, so, so these are some, you know, challenging questions that you might have to answer. Um, so one of those challenges is that accessibility is often um, kind of an unknown or a mysterious requirement. It, it, it can be seen as complicated or, or vague. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that most or if not all people on this call are familiar with the Web Content Accessibility guide, Guidelines, or, or WCAG, as, as they're sometimes um, called. Uh, and, and you know, if you sit down and try to read this stuff, it, it might be, it might seem a, a little bit vague or ambiguous, and, and that's by design, uh, I'm sure, because of you know, technologies are always evolving. But um, you know, to leadership that's weighing where they're going to put their investments, uh, something that that is kind of vague and um, difficult to understand uh, is going to be problematic when you're when you're trying to succeed. Um, a, a lot of you, um, like myself, may have been introduced to accessibility via uh, some kind of complaint or or litigious event or um, you know it's some kind of thing where people are telling you that you're not. Um, meeting some standard and you're surprised by that or, or your leadership is surprised by that. And, and that has the potential to kind of sour, um, you know, the, the feeling towards accessibility, right? Like this is some compliance thing. People are telling us that we're not doing our jobs well. And, uh, you know, if that's your first, uh, you know, as a development leader or, or, a, or a business leader, if that's your first sort of foray into accessibility, um, it, it, it might kind of leave a bad taste in your mouth, right? You're, you're you're forgetting about the humans at the other end of this, and it just feels like some regulation that's being dropped on you, and and you weren't you were surprised by it, and it, it disrupted your, you know, maybe one of your releases or or um, you know your roadmap in some way. So you know that's something to consider when you're when you're talking to to other people in your organization. Um, uh, development and and um, quality assurance uh, groups are in my experience, you know, are operating at or close at or close to capacity. So there's, if you're going to tell somebody that they need to comply with a new set of rules or guidelines or, you know, do some kind of code quality thing that they're not already doing, uh, you need to make that simple for them and, you know, convince them that there's value in taking that on. Again, I, I doubt any of these people are, are, you know, w willingly trying to make things more difficult for people with disabilities. But at the end of the day, I've got my guys working, you know, eight hours a day on what they're working on and you're introducing new or vague requirements. How, you know, make that easy for me. Tell me how, how this is going to work. And, you know, lastly, the, the risk of doing nothing um, is not always apparent to, to, to the business leaders and to, um, the technology leaders and the QA leaders um, in your organization. So if you're not in that situation of, you know, we've had a lawsuit or, um, you know, we have some real um, deadline or, or um, uh, decree that we must be accessible, um, it, you have to kind of 
uh, choose, um, you know, the carrot or the, or the stick you know, and to make these people aware um, that this is the right thing to do and we can, we can make it easy for you. It doesn't have to be super complicated. So, um, like I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, my first, um, how, how I be decided that accessibility was going to be my career, right? I, I mentioned that uh, I was a customer of DQ uh, and um, it, that, that was, um, you know, not something that, that I woke up in the morning and, and thought about doing. I you know, was designing UI and working on design and, and user experience and all these different things on a, you know, a, a pretty uh, major well-known website. And, you know, it, it, the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of people and um, organizations design for themselves, right? So I didn't realize that, you know, maybe I, you, I build a little component or a widget and I smoke test it and it works for me. But what about people who consume digital content different than me? I never really thought about that. Um, so, you know, my, my story starts as just a regular um, UI dev, you know, working for Capital One. I think I'm allowed to say that, right? You can look me up on LinkedIn. And, <laughs> and um, accessibility just kind of popped up. So, you know, like many organizations, um, we, we had some grassroots interest in accessibility. One of the first guys I met when I, when I joined Capital One um, was, was all about it, but he was all alone. It was just an interest that, that he had you know, identified. It was important to him. He realized that it was the right thing to do and, and you know, all of the other reasons that we want to um, pursue delivering accessible content. But there was really no centralized um, funding or governor, governance or plan around um, making sure that we were accessible. So, you know, we had, we had champions, but we hadn't really identified and organized um, and really got together and made anything happen. So, you know, the, the attention to accessibility was present, but it was, it was really through um, designers, um, you know, like graphic designers, visual designers, and uh, the UI developers that, that brought their designs to life that had just picked up best practices, maybe at former jobs or through research or, you know, just trying to, to do the right thing. Um, until um, th there was a, a big news story going on at Target around this time. This was like 2010, 2009. And um, th this was in the papers, you know, and I, I had some really smart um, leaders in my business, some senior executives that, that were reading about this, and they were concerned, you know, concerned from all of the areas that you would be concerned, right? Um, is, are we at risk, first and foremost, right? Am I going to get fired because we're going to show up in the paper, you know, in, in a similar situation? Um, are we doing the right thing because, you know, by our brand, right? Like, we want to be known as a brand that it is open to all and you know there, there's brand reputation um, risk surrounding accessibility right you never want to um, you know be known as, as an excluder and, and and this was was interesting and it, it really it moved the needle a little bit um, but didn't necessarily come with any budget I, I, I can remember a few getting pulled into you know some really senior meetings you know, I'm, I, while I'm a lowly you know UI developer and they're saying, hey, you, you know a little bit about this. Go figure out where we're at. You know, what are we doing? How do we stack up against the competition? What should we do? We don't we don't want to be um, in the news the way the way Target is. And if anybody from Target is on the phone, I'm a longtime customer. I know lots of people that worked on Target's accessibility team. I'm not this is not a, uh, a, a don't want to put you in the spotlight, but it is an interesting story. And, you know, to, Full disclosure, Target went on to develop a, a really great accessibility program. Um, we also had something that, that some of you may or may not um, uh, have as part of your uh, journey or story. And this is kind of where I, where I cheated a little bit, but um, we had an acquisition um, with, with a set of products and services that came along with an already in place accessibility agreement. So, 
this was really how you know me and my team were able to kind of short circuit the what should we do about this and um, really get access to some budget so long story short um, because of our, our time here today I, I won't tell the whole story but um, we absolutely had to do something by a certain day because there was um, you know a, a business reason that we had to be accessible and, and you'll have that when it um, you know, if you're being sued or if um, in, in this particular case an acquisition and it makes things maybe a little bit easier, but, but that tends to be temporary, right? So you have, um, you have my full um, attention, you know, from the business and you have access to the budget and let's make this thing accessible, but that doesn't last forever. And so long story short is we were, you know, we partnered with DQ, um, shameless plug there, <laughs> and we, we made everything happen that needed to happen. But that, you know, accessibility is a program and not a project. So, you know, we, w with the top down focus on accessibility that we had in that situation and access to, you know, an acquisition or a merger budget, um, which many of you may have had experience with, it's it's probably no surprise that we were able to succeed, right? Like we we um, you know put money at the problem, and we were able we we found the right partner and partners, and um, you know we were able to meet that particular goal goal. Um, but again, accessibility uh, for organizations is not a project that with a start and an end time. It is a you know it needs to be woven into design, dev, test, and delivery DNA. It needs to become part of code quality, um, just like anything else, like SEO, like performance, like security, uh, like things that are really easy to, to, to talk to leadership about, right? So what we're really talking about today is how do we position accessibility just like any of those other, um, you know, some people call them non-functional requirements, uh, it, what have you. Um, but you know, just the way we do business and the way that, that we achieve quality. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some, some angles or approaches with different types of, of leadership, right? So you know, uh, I, I think it's important to understand that um, your, your bosses have their own um, goals and priorities and I, I'm be willing to wager that they all care about accessibility, but they have to weigh that against all of the other things that are going on, right? Um, so should we do this now? Should we do this later? Um, it, are we talking about uh, risk or reward? Or, are we under pressure or are we trying to achieve something? And, and for those of you who can't um, see my screen, I just have a slide that says um, to choose the appropriate approach and it has a carrot versus a stick. Um, it, which is, you know, a, co a common thing that we all understand. Um, so why do it now? Um, the, so the chances are your development teams are going to have to do something about accessibility at some point. So, you know, why should we wait? Um, an interesting note here um, that, that's uh, some recent data is that lawsuits related to accessibility, whether, um, you know, we, we all have our opinions about the um, validity of some of those lawsuits versus the, the ones that really matter. But at the end of the day, the lawsuits related to accessibility have um, sharply risen it, with an increase of 181% um, from 2017 to 2018. I, I think the numbers are like 815 to 2200 something um, just in that one year. And, you know, when you, when you have a lawsuit or a complaint, um, that that gets settled, and, and I, I you know I can cite a lot of personal experience um, uh, about this. They're often um, they're often aggressive timelines, and, and and not just lawsuits. Like what changes in regulations for for airline um, for the airline industry, the Department of Transportation with the Air Carrier Access Act um, put really aggressive um, timelines in place for the entire. Uh, vertical there, right? For everybody that was doing air travel with um, a certain amount of seats into or out of the United States. So it's not just a lawsuit. It could be a change in the regulation in your um, particular sector. Um, that can really mess with your release schedules and, and, 
you know, slow down or halt your feature development and your ability to compete and, you know, push, push new features and, and uh, things like that. So you want to do, uh, you know, what you want to tell your management is we want to do this proactively and we want to do it on our own timeline. Um, and sometimes you won't necessarily have that ability um, if there is some kind of legal uh, decree in place. Um, so the, uh, there's another visual on my screen now, and, and the title is The Cost of Doing Nothing. Um, this is a, uh, and, and the source is cited here, but this is a, um, a study on um, discovering and fixing defects in the cost done by IBM. This was about security, but you know, I, I firmly believe that things like security or performance or um, accessibility kind of have the same associated uh, moving parts, right? With, with how they're detected, um, fixed, tested and released. And this just kind of shows, um, you know, that this is a really powerful graphic for leadership, right? Like we can, um, there's another slide that I, now that I'm thinking of it, wish I put in this presentation by um, Frank Lloyd Wright, who says, you know, it, that the cost of fixing something at the drafting table versus, you know, with a pencil versus using it, uh, a sledgehammer on the job site is, you know, quite different, right? So we want to detect the stuff as early as possible. We want to shift left. Uh, we don't want to be caught in um, a situation where these problems are exposed to our, our customers as well. Um, so, you know, repeat visitors to, to my colleague Noah's um, talks about uh, how accessibility fits in development might recognize slides like this, but um, this is another kind of thing to avoid. Oftentimes you can get some buy-in from leadership that says, yeah, let's do something about accessibility. Every time we release, we'll, we'll go check some stuff, right? You, you want to avoid that sort of audit mentality and build this into um, the, the dev test release DNA, right? So you train the people who are designing, empower the developers and the testers with tools, and then also keep an eye on what's going on in production. Um, so, I think I'm right on time, 124. Uh, so, just just kind of a recap, and we'll we'll open up for questions. Um, so, you know, what we really talked about is like even small steps that will help um, your leadership and your organization with risk. This makes your boss look good. This makes um, you know this this mitigates risk that I, I mentioned that some of those lawsuits you know may may not be um, coming from the right place, but some of them are very real and they have real humans at the end of them um, that, that are trying to access goods and services. So you want to you want to avoid that, and you know worst case scenario you want to be ready to respond to those things and and um, you know fix that for your customers. Um, automation and tooling, uh, you know. Shameless plug, we, we have a lot of great tools at DQ, but whatever tools you choose, you know, make sure that, that you, you vet those and you trust them before, you know, you, you um, start running scans and reports and shipping them out to others in your organization, you know, make sure that results are accurate. But that's a great first step with, with a high return on investment to just start building um, automated testing into, you know, the way you're already shipping your content. Um, identifying partners in other areas of the business. Again, I, I didn't talk about that as much as I wanted to today, but uh, you know, seek out people in legal and compliance, um, maybe HR, user experience, um, design. You know, there, there are so many other people that probably already care about accessibility that would love to um, you know, connect with you and help you sort of laterally um, make your case to your leadership and, and to others in your organization. Um, and then finally, you know, accessibility is really just simply code quality. All engineering departments, all development managers want high quality code. They want things to download and run fast. They want things to be secure and they want their users to trust them with their personal information. Um, the, your, your business partners want high ranking search engine optimization, which, you know, has overlap with accessibility. We're, it, there's no argument to, to wanting, you know, high quality code or not. So if you can just make accessibility part of that conversation, 
you know, you, you might be able to get better adoption from your leadership and, you know, with that, some investment, some real time and money investment. Um, so that's, um, well, I'll throw this slide up on the screen. Um, while we get into q and I haven't been looking at the screen. Laura, keep me honest here. Do we have questions that I might be able to answer yeah. now? Yeah, we do. So the first one, which I think is a good question is, um, what's a good, what, what should people do if their country um, or their organization is doesn't have a law for accessibility? What if they don't have um, a formal law in place, which is, you know, pushing that risk-based argument? Great question. Um, can I ask what country that came from? Doesn't say, unfortunately. <laughs> that, that's fine. Um, well, the fact of the matter is that that is the United States. If, if you really think about it, um, the only sectors really that we operate in um, are, are the federal government and, like I mentioned before, the airline industry that have hard and fast decrees that, that content must be accessible. Um, globally, the, the trend is that the web content accessibility guidelines um, put forth by the, the W3C uh, are, are, are sort of the, the understood standard of what everybody should be trying to adhere to. Um, so for, for that particular situation, and the, the way I've lived for the past 10 years is um, really just telling stories about, you know, I'm not a lawyer here, so keep, you know, don't take this as legal advice, but I, I'd call it case law, right? So when I told the story about Target, that was a real story where um, somebody made a complaint that their access to goods and services wasn't equal based on their disability. And the judge, like what happens in many cases, had to interpret that and make a decision. Sometimes they, the, the plaintiff wins, sometimes they don't. Um, but the, the press is really the same. So. Um, the, the way that I would position that is if it's not a law now, it, it probably will be um, at some point. And even if it's not a law, somebody can can sue you and, and the interpretation in the courts can be, um, you know, the real problem is that the in our country, for example, the American uh, uh, Disabilities Act, the ADA, was written before the web. So there's a lot of interpretation and, you know, legal um, conversation around well does that does a place of public accommodation include a website and and more often than not the, the courts will rule that that is the case so um, you don't necessarily have to have a hard and fast law or decree um, to to want to do something about this just to get ahead of it great so um, we're at time but I think there's one more question um, we can ask and then answer the others offline but the last one which I wanted to throw out there is what, what is a good argument to convince um, a boss and design team that even uh, B2B apps um, and accessibility are important? Um, I, I think the arguments are, uh, are largely the same in that, um, you know, you, you can never really make assumptions about the consumers of, of the, the UI or the digital content. So even if it's B2B, um, you know, the risk pool might be smaller, but if you're developing an application for another business, um, you know, uh, I would hope that their HR policies would allow people with disabilities to be employed there and they may want to use that application at some time. Um, so it just, it, it, it's really tricky. It depends on who you're selling to and you know, what, what the end user um, situation is. But it, again, there, there are some overlaps with um, you know, usability and good, good user experience and, and SEO and some other things like that that might be able um, to help that argument. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's just um, it, a lot of times in a B2B situation, they'll ask you, you know, for a VPAT, uh, as we um, call it in the United States, or, or some um, uh, proof that your application is accessible, but even if they don't, you, you know, you never know what might happen tomorrow. They might say that, oh, we have a new employee that's a screen reader user that's using our system, um, or we're rebranding what you're making, and you know, we're not sure about our audience. So, I, I don't think that um, direct to consumer is any re really any different than B two B when it comes to um, making that argument. Great, thanks, Travis. 
And if we didn't get to your questions, we'll answer those offline. I do see that some people um, ask their questions anonymously. So if you would like those questions answered, feel free to um, you know, send me a quick email. That way we can reply back to you. Um, and another reminder, we'll be sending out the slides and this recording um, early next week. And then lastly, we hope that we see you all at CSUN, the um, accessibility conference next week, if you are planning on attending. Oh, I forgot to plug CSUN. I'm sorry, Laura. I'll, I will be at CSUN. Um, if anybody wants to come see me or Laura or the rest of DQ, we, we've got multiple events going on there. Um, Laura, do they have an email address for the questions? Because there's not one on my screen. I just have... Uh, yeah, you know. they can um, reply back to the reminder emails they got uh, okay, for the webinar. Those will go right to my inbox and I will pass great. those along. Sorry for going a little bit over. I, I look forward to answering your questions offline and hopefully seeing some of you in Anaheim. Great. Thanks, everybody.